my disappointment is immeasurable. And my day is ruined. Final Fantasy. A franchise near and dear to my heart, having grown up watching my dad play the early games before diving into some of the later entries on my own, with Final Fantasy IX becoming one of my favorite games of all time. Final Fantasy is the franchise that pivoted my attention towards the style of long-form storytelling and is solely responsible for my love of JRPGs as a genre. I was there when the Final Fantasy VII tech demo for the PS3 appeared, I was there when Final Fantasy XIII damn near Sonic 06 the series, and naturally I was there when Final Fantasy XV came out of development hell. Following the success of Final Fantasy VII Remake and deep in the waters of jubilant expectation of rebirth, I was beyond excited for a brand new numbered entry in the mainline series. With what we had literally been given just three years prior in VII Remake, I was positive Final Fantasy XVI was going to be something memorable, and it most certainly was, just not for the reasons I was hoping. Now this video isn't just going to be me bashing on a game just for weird contrarian internet points because despite how it may come across, I really wanted this game to be magnificent. Everything I'm going to say over the course of this video comes from a place of genuine love for this franchise. To that end, I will be explaining why things didn't click for me because it's important that we're on the same page during this journey. This isn't simply a haha, the game sucks, the end type of thing. That's not my style. It's imperative that you understand why I walked away from this experience feeling the way I do because it seems as though I'm the one in the minority with my opinions here, which does happen to the best of us. But after seeing the nearly universal critical acclaim for this game's story, characters, and combat, I legitimately can't help but wonder if I even played the same game as everyone else. Uh, there's a game like uh, Final Fantasy 16. It's very easy, but it's also very fun. What do you mean? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? There will be spoilers here, so if you haven't played FF16 and intend to, this is your warning. Normally, I'd say go engage with the media I'm about to spoil, but I couldn't care any less if I physically tried. This won't be a comprehensive breakdown of the story because while it's also got issues of its own, it's just one of many this game has. I'm going to quote a content creator I enjoy, JXE, because they said something I find to be relevant as we begin and I couldn't think of a better way to express this sentiment. If you like this game, that's fine. But if you needed me to tell you that in order for you to not get angry with me, that's not fine. Grow the fuck up. What the fuck is this piece of shit? Let's begin with the story and branch off from there, since most of the issues I have with the game are somewhat interconnected. As a very brief synopsis, you play as Clive, the firstborn son of the Archduke of Rosaria, who was initially intended to become the kingdom's dominant of fire, inheriting the powers of Rosaria's protector, the Icon Phoenix. Icons are FF16's iteration of the summons we've come to know from the franchise like Shiva, Bahamut, Odin, etc. Dominants channel the power of their kingdom's icon to ensure the safety of their homeland from other kingdoms, each of which have a dominant of their own. Much to the dismay of the royal family, Clive fails to become the dominant and instead, his younger brother Joshua is bestowed with the blessings of the phoenix. Instead of becoming insufferable and crawling in his crawl, Clive takes on the role of Joshua's shield, his personal protector. Unbeknownst to Clive, his mom betrays their kingdom, things go to hell in a handbasket, and Joshua is presumably killed by a second icon of fire, something that shouldn't exist, which we'll talk about momentarily. In the aftermath, Clive is captured and sold into slavery where he serves as a disposable mercenary for the next 13 years, with the only thing keeping him going being the thought of finding his brother's killer and enacting his revenge. Not the worst setup, but we'll cycle back to this in a little bit. The overall plot is that Clive wants to create a better world for bearers, people in this world that can use magic without the use of crystals. In this world, bearers are reviled, persecuted, seen as less than, and so on. They're often sold into slavery and worked until their bodies literally petrify. To make it easy to spot a bearer, they're branded with what looks like a large tattoo, usually along the jawline and cheek somewhere, which is what we see on Clive's face after the first time skip. The game even takes the time at the beginning to point out that Clive is kind to bearers because he shows them the absolute bare minimum of human decency. Hell, there's even a sequence where Mother gives up her newborn baby because she realized it's a bearer, and the people she tells are basically like, wow, you sure dodged a bullet on that one. Better luck with the next kid. It's a very heavy-handed allegory for prejudice and discrimination, a topic that should have been handled with extreme care considering how rampant the issues of prejudice and discrimination still are in the world. Anyway, Clive's solution to the social issues of his world is to destroy what are known as Mother Crystals, the source of a resource known as Aether, which is what allows the citizens of this world to use magic. Without the Mother Crystals, there would be no magic and thus, no need to discriminate and persecute bearers. On top of that, the Mother Crystals, despite being responsible for the way people live their lives as well as entire belief systems, are responsible for causing more and more of the land to become completely uninhabitable. This leads Clive to eventually learn his primary antagonist is a being known as Ultima, who has been pulling the strings behind the scenes for years. 
Now, in theory, the framework of the story is perfectly serviceable and despite all the details left out, probably sounds like a halfway decent Final Fantasy story. Unfortunately, none of the threads really feel like they mesh well together, very specifically the idea of discrimination versus the freedom from the Mother Crystals. While I made it sound like these two elements weave into another seamlessly, they mostly ignore each other. See, despite the marketing of the game flaunting that the crystals have decided our fate for too long, we don't even hear about the Mother Crystals being a potential problem until about 12 to 15 hours into the story. For comparison, by the time you reach the 10 hour mark in Final Fantasy IX, you're already moving on to Disc 2 with a firm understanding of the stakes coming off the heels of a devastating defeat at the hands of a future ally in the presence of your primary antagonist. However, for Final Fantasy XVI, once Clive's attention is shifted to the problem of the Mother Crystals, the entirety of the plotline regarding the issues of the Bearers virtually disappears. The most you'll hear about it is when one of the side characters and dominant of Shiva, Clive's childhood friend Jill, sometimes points out that people might be less inclined to speak to him because of his brand. But even that stops happening after Clive has his brand removed. Aside from that, with the exception of side quests, which I'll get into later, the only time we hear about Bearers in the second half of the story is during the many moments where Clive reminds the audience of his motivations. But this in itself isn't sufficient, since it feels less like we're getting invested into the plight of a section of the population that's explicitly designed to elicit empathy, and instead being reminded that those people exist. Once Ultima becomes the focus of Clive's anger and obsession, the most relatable theme of the story is quietly and unceremoniously swept to the side. Something about this subplot also feels incomplete. Consider who the oppressed class is in this game. It's a bunch of people that are capable of using magic without the use of a crystal. They're inherently more powerful than those who oppress them, and it seems odd to me that there's never a moment where at least one population come together and attempt a revolt. And I don't mean a resistance like Clive belongs to, a revolt, Nat Turner style. We don't even hear any hints at a past revolt being quickly crushed, which would explain why bearers don't attempt it for fear of meeting the same fate. That would be more than enough for me to wave away this gap in the narrative and focus on the many other issues with the story. And while we're on the topic of the bearers, let me go ahead and say that I'm looking at the concepts and themes of discrimination and prejudice from a very specifically western perspective. Those themes have a much heavier and often more uncomfortable weight that comes with them thanks to the west's history with colonialism and the slave trade, as well as the ripple effects of those realities that we're still wrestling with to this day. So I can only levy my own criticisms about how these themes were handled through my own lens as a westerner, which to a degree is a kind of selfishness. As was pointed out to me, and rightfully so, Japan has its own less than sunny history with imperialism and the horrors associated with it. So it would be disingenuous of me to fail to acknowledge that that eastern history very likely factored into how these eastern developers decided to handle this very touchy topic. How they present their views on oppression via their understanding of their own history is going to be inherently different than how we here in the West engage with that same discussion. It isn't necessarily due to disrespect, but merely a difference of how those themes played out in different areas of the world. Now I do want to briefly take a moment to talk about the floating criticisms of the lack of diversity in FF16. I mostly agree with this criticism, but maybe not in quite the way you might. Final Fantasy has always had an interesting history with people of color, and there is a conversation to be had there, but at the very least we knew those types of people existed in those worlds. I can freely admit that Barrett is just a copy and pasted Mr. T who himself was already a less than flattering parody of black masculinity, but we mostly gave it a pass because Barrett was likable. Saz from FF13, however, legitimately made my blood boil because of just how hard it leaned into stereotypes. But then you have someone like Rude, who is just a guy doing a job, no exaggerated features, intelligent, often funny, and again, despite any faults you might find, he was likable. My issue with the lack of representation isn't that there are no black main characters, because it's not about that for me. For me, it was the feeling that there weren't any identifiable people of color in this world, aside from the ambiguously brown people that could generously be said are representative of Middle Eastern identities. We spend so much time traveling across this world. We've seen magic, goblins, we've seen people turn into literal deities, but I can't get some random egghead in the background chopping down a tree or something? It's enough for me to be walking through a world and see a random black or brown person, or hell, even Eastern Asian people, because then I know that we exist in that world that is trying to get me immersed. I don't need some black dude to run up, kick the big bad in the head, and save the day, I just want to know that people that look like me also exist somewhere in the world, just minding their business. When I mention the lack of POC, people immediately, almost instinctively, begin associating the oppressed with POC, and I think while that's heavily associated with the ugly history of the West, it also says more about the person making that connection than the game itself. I also don't need the oppressed group to be people of color because A, I can't think of a single AAA game studio that could pull that off without a shitstorm of bad PR, and B, I don't have some weird victim complex. 
Sometimes it really is as simple as just noticing that there are people of color in the background completely independent of whatever bullshit the protagonist is up to. Sure, there are going to be people that want to see black and brown main characters more often, specifically characters that aren't caricatures of black masculinity or identity like Barrett or Saz, regardless of if that character happens to be likable despite the blatant problems. And I do count myself among the folks that want to see proper representation, don't let me make you think otherwise. My point here is that the conversation is more nuanced than a lot of people, myself very much included, often take the time to acknowledge. I'm not personally approaching the themes of oppression and discrimination from a western or racial approach. My issue with it lies entirely with its sloppy storytelling. But let's get back on track. The Ultima portion of the story unfolds like a bastardized amalgamation of the politics of Game of Thrones and the supernatural elements of The Witcher, but with a frankly stunning absence of the intrigue that made those traits work for those franchises. The world of Alisthea is made up of several kingdoms all with their own motivations, the bare minimum of culture, and most importantly their own dominance. When we're not with Clive, we're watching some of the most boring cutscenes I have ever had the displeasure of sitting through. They're so dry and devoid of any real personality or flavor. It can be rough to tolerate at the best of times, but once you realize that the game is upward of 80% cutscenes, it takes the wind out of your sails even more, but I'll touch on this further when we get to the gameplay. FF16 does a terrible job of setting up potential plot twists, with everything being telegraphed so blatantly that when something does happen, you very likely saw it coming hours prior. For example, when Joshua is quote unquote murdered by a second dominant of fire, it was painfully obvious that this second dominant was Clive himself. On its own, I wouldn't care. The kind of twist where the protagonist is the guilty party all along isn't new by any stretch of the imagination. And oftentimes, it's hidden from the player or audience well enough that when it is revealed, you're truly taken by surprise. But both me and people in my Twitch chat were immediately able to sniff it out, which made the next few hours of story unbearable since Clive's entire driving force at that point was to find his brother's killer. Which turned out to be him! Except not really, because Joshua wasn't dead, something else we saw coming a mile away. This was also very easy to discern because A, we didn't see a body in the aftermath, and a rule of thumb in media is that if you don't see the body, there's a decent chance the character isn't truly dead. And B, Joshua was the dominant of the Phoenix, known in the Final Fantasy universe for its healing properties and revival powers. Even outside the Final Fantasy universe, the Phoenix is the symbol of rebirth, so it isn't much of a leap to the obvious conclusion of Joshua's survival. Running hand in hand with the actual narrative, I want to very briefly talk about the idea and execution of time skips. As the name implies, in a piece of fiction, a time skip is a narrative device where a period is skipped over, presumably because nothing of real interest happens within that window and the important stuff is yet to come. Time skips are a relatively divisive topic since their execution can be pretty lacking at times. The skip forward in something like Naruto was perfectly fine because we understood everyone was spending their time training, which would have gotten repetitive and dull. Yet the skip forward in FF15 felt like we'd been cheated out of interesting stories regarding the principal characters in the sudden and mysterious absence of Noctis. In that situation, many players were curious what Ignis, Gladio, and Prompto had been up to, and how they survived in a world suddenly drowning in darkness. But we just get told, yeah man, it was pretty rough, and the game moves on. Final Fantasy XVI has two major time skips in its story. The first is technically a flashback since we begin the game as 28-year-old Clive, but the real problem here is the 13-year gap that exists between the fall of Rosaria and the presumed loss of everyone he cares about, and the current moment in time. Naturally, adult Clive is much different than his teenage self, but he's much more dour and sounds like he's been gargling sand. Now on a very basic human level, I'd hope his adult self was different than his younger version, but I can't help but feel cheated out of what was very likely a heartbreaking and grim story about a teenager who'd lost everything being put through the harsh cycle of war, as well as dealing with the reality of suddenly going from being a respected member of a royal family to being a bearer who was now treated like he was worth less than the dirt he walked on. Characters don't change overnight, even when riddled with grief and loss. So by skipping forward over an entire decade of this man's life, we've essentially taken some of the most interesting character development and threw it away. We don't get to see that charm and optimism slowly wrung out of him, and we don't get to see him gain and lose any true friends. We don't even see him get branded. There was legitimately no reason to skip this portion of his life when you could have made his entire journey about the march toward freedom, avenging his brother, and all the Mother Crystal slash Ultima stuff. Hell, you can even keep the plotline with wanting to free the bearers, which would be so much punchier in its execution after playing through Clive's experiences as a new bearer and dealing with those prejudices firsthand. There are still people loyal to Rosaria's royal family in the game, so there's still an avenue for all the political intrigue by making Clive gain something of a following and attempt to reclaim his homeland. And since we know Joshua is still alive, he could have had his own side of the narrative where maybe we switch between perspectives from chapter to chapter. But okay, sure, let's ignore that first time skip and just play through the current timeline. 
Well, after you destroy your first Mother Crystal and a character named Sid dies following a boss fight, the entire place begins to collapse around us in a way that makes you wonder how we're going to make it out. Much to my surprise, the game simply switches to a cutscene that says five years later. Five years later? Th what? We get no answers regarding how our characters made it out of that situation, but what's worse, we're told that Clive took on Siv's name as a way to honor him and his mission to look after the Bearers, and we're told how much trouble Clive has been kicking up for the authorities. He's apparently been going around freeing Bearers, building up a reputation for himself. Now, setting aside how annoying it is to suddenly have a character that's being addressed by two separate names at any point based on who he's talking to, but we're in the exact same situation as we were with a 13 year gap. The story has lurched forward and has chosen to skip over a ton of potentially interesting events including the grief of a man who lost a good friend as well as his decision to take up the mantle of Sid. We're told how Clive's actions have been making life harder for bearers and how they blame him for their increased suffering instead of allowing us as the player to do our best to help, only to slowly realize over time we're making things worse for the people we're trying to help. We're not even shown the moments when Clive decides to have his brand surgically removed, becoming what's known as a curse breaker. Removing the brand is a process we're told is both excruciating and exceedingly dangerous, but it's skipped right over. So we never see him get branded, and we never see him at the very least decide to have the brand removed, he just suddenly has a scar where the brand once was. At this point you're handicapping the story you're trying to tell instead of just taking it back to the drawing board and reworking it so that the narrative can flow without the use of major time skips. There are already tons of minor skips forward where the game will say sometime later, which could have easily allowed for the same story to play out with Team Clive and would have made for much more organic world building. In a game like Skyrim where you can go all over the place, just kind of dick around to your heart's content and engage with the main narrative on your own schedule, there doesn't necessarily need to be a smooth or even coherent flow of time between events. It's your adventure, do what you will, when you will. In a game like FF16, you do need a consistent and coherent flow of time, especially in a world where traveling from place to place is easier said than done in the absence of trains or airships. So having those small skips, those sometime later skips, keeps the flow of time believable and immersive since yeah, I imagine it takes some time for Clive to walk from one kingdom all the way to another. But the important thing is that we're not missing anything during those short skips forward which exists solely to spare the player the tedium. Although there was one minor skip that threw me and my chat for a bit of a loop. After the battle with Garuda following Clive's first transformation into Ifrit, we get one of the minor jumps forward and suddenly Clive is chained up in a cell, naked. I was like, wait, back up, I need to know what the hell's going on here. Very brief side note, but someone at Squeenix must have been very horny because there's a decent bit of random nakedness and sexual tension in this game, like awkwardly so. You never see any nipples or dongs or anything, but there are plenty of moments where Chad and I were just like, why are they naked? The point I'm making here is that time skips weren't necessary in this game to tell the story they wanted to tell. They simply didn't want to put in the legwork to do the heavy lifting required to make that version of the story work. While we're in this lane, we might as well talk about the cast of this game because it's definitely a mixed bag. Clive is your bog standard traumatized brood boy for nearly the entirety of the game, which is unfortunate because I very much enjoyed the time we spend with 15 year old Clive. His attitude is much lighter, the vocal performance was solid, and he had a better character design. The Clive we inhabit for the other 98% of the game has about the same amount of charisma as a bowl of stagnant dog water, and the vocal performance, while good in its own way, is incredibly boring. So many of the male characters in this game speak in that low, raspy whisper like they're all auditioning to be in Game of Thrones. And I blamed another for what I did. To spare myself the guilt. No, this isn't a battle you can win with words. Believe me, I've tried. And I doubt the Crusaders will wait for the good king's pawns to line up before taking to the board. I would have appreciated a bit more personality from our main protagonist. Then you have the Sid I mentioned a few minutes ago, because there always needs to be a Sid in a Final Fantasy game. He's one of the few genuinely likable characters who also speaks in a gruff, grumbly tone. Like Clive, he's a dominant but one of lightning, channeling the powers of Rama. Rama? Ramu? I, I don't know how to fucking say that name. It's Sid that sets the plot to destroy the Mother Crystals in motion after taking Clive under his wing and giving him a safe place to stay with other bearers. He's a bit more entertaining than Clive, but he dies early enough in the story that you do begin to miss his presence as the characters get less and less entertaining. You've got Jill, Clive and Joshua's childhood friend who was raised alongside them like a sibling as a way to ensure the kingdom she was from never raised arms against Rosaria. Also a dominant, Jill channels the powers of the ice icon, Shiva. Jill does begin as quite a likable character with a solid design, a good head on her shoulders, and everything else she needs to be memorable, but over the course of the game slowly loses her relevance until you forget she's there at all. A constant joke I made during my playthrough was, oh yeah, Jill's here too, I guess. Next up there's Torgal. He's just a dog and he's perfect. 
Lastly is Joshua himself, who is very much alive. Chandler Riggs over here is honestly so frustrating to watch because he seems like he'd be an infinitely better protagonist than Clive. His performance is nuanced and charismatic, he's got a great character design, he's also a dominant of fire, and he's just all around more intriguing. Every time Joshua had a cutscene to give us more insight into his activities, I found myself invested. He's the exact kind of character I'd want to play as in a Final Fantasy story like this one. There are plenty of side characters, but they don't have the flair or personality to justify going into detail about, and several of the relevant side characters are just the vendors. Nobody has what could be considered an iconic design. Everyone has a very basic fantasy aesthetic to them. I know the team that worked on this wanted to pivot away from the future fantasy vibes they'd picked up with 13, 15, and even with the Fleshed Out 7 remake, but I do think the pendulum swung too hard in the other direction. Something that pulled me out of the story is how Shakespearean the dialogue felt. While I can give the voice actors their flowers for their performances, I was not a fan of the script itself. The old theatrical vernacular is outdated and much worse, it's boring. Sure, Final Fantasy has been slowly heading towards a future punk aesthetic ever since FF7, but even in a more fantastical world like FF9, the dialogue never stuck out as a negative because it still felt natural. People spoke in a way you could relate to regardless of your background. What's better, everyone in FF9's speech patterns were based on their backgrounds and personal experiences. Zidane was much more laid back in etiquette and manners because he basically lived on the streets before joining Tantalus. Vivi is very reserved and curious, but polite because he's a child that grew up with a kind grandfather in an isolated area. Garnett is exceedingly formal and doesn't exactly understand common slang because she was raised as royalty and conducts herself as such. I guess I'm also just tired of fantasy equaling people with English accents. It's a trope I'd very much like to see disappear, or at the very least, diversified. On the last leg of the story, and before we get into the mechanics of the game, I do want to talk about the Active Time Lore, which is a system I cannot overstate how much I despise. Active Time Lore is a system in which, during cutscenes, you can press and hold the touchpad on the controller to bring up what essentially amounts to a conversation-specific compendium. This small compendium will show you all of the relevant names and locations that were brought up in the discussion, and clicking on one of those icons will bring up a blurb for you to read. These blurbs will clue you in about who a character is, how they relate, what a certain kingdom's culture is, etc. I have no issue with compendiums on a very general level, but I think this system is both lazy and disruptive. First and foremost, why on earth would I want to interrupt the flow of a conversation in order to spend five minutes reading paragraphs of sometimes relevant information? Second, it's just lazy storytelling in my opinion. This game is excessively guilty of the telling instead of showing sin, and this makes it so that the devs don't have to show you anything. Important bits of information that will often supplement your knowledge to give you a better understanding of the world are crammed in here. Doing so removes the burden of proper world building from the shoulders of the developers and forces that onto the player. You don't understand why this thing and that thing are important? Sucks to suck, loser, you should have done your fucking homework. And I know there are going to be people that say, well, it's completely optional, you don't have to read it. And that's true, but then you as the player will quite literally know and understand less about the world around you if you skip out on it. Look at all this extra lore that they expect you to read in the middle of cutscenes. It's fucking ridiculous. To make matters worse, the active time lore updates as the game goes on, so if you're one of those people that genuinely wants the full experience, you'll be interrupting your own cutscenes constantly just to see if anything new appeared. I said this was lazy because of how it treats the world building as your responsibility instead of teaching you about the world through the gameplay loop. Look at Final Fantasy IX. When you begin the game, you know basically nothing about the world. But as the story moves you from place to place, you learn about the many kingdoms on Gaia, their relationships with each other, and what their cultures are like. You learn about the tense peace between Alexandria and Lindblom organically. You learn about the isolation of Clara organically. You learn about the mist being a source of fear for citizens organically. You learn about Bermisha's relation to Clara organically, etc, etc, etc. What's even crazier is that FF9 has its own version of active time lore called active time events. These are very brief scenes that show you what other characters are doing while you're separated from them, typically giving them more characterization, and it does so without ruining the flow of the story because it's adding on to the information you already have in a way that is both engaging and respects your time as a player. Sure, you can completely ignore them, and if you do, the story still does the legwork to make sure you understand exactly what's going on. More impressively, even if you ignore the active time events, each character still goes through their proper arcs during the main narrative. Aside from the active time lore, there's a character named Vivian who at several intervals in the story gives you a complex breakdown of the state of play regarding the ongoing conflict between kingdoms, troop movements, strategies, etc. I'm sure someone somewhere thought this was an excellent idea, but here's the thing, it's not. The first problem we run into is that these glorified PowerPoint presentations are mandatory. 
I'm sure you can skip these scenes once they begin, but then it goes back to the idea of you're missing out on important information about the world, so you kind of feel like you have to sit through it. What makes it worse is that it's not even an interesting exposition dump. It feels like you're sitting in a social studies or political science class and you're supposed to be taking notes. Rather, its church does. But this is not the pragmatic approach to state religion employed by the Holy Empire. Uh, is that going to be on the test? The thing that makes these moments even more ridiculous is that about 98% of the information Vivian relays to you is completely irrelevant to you as the player and the task at hand. You get told who's fighting who, where they are, what their troop formations and movement are like, and then you end up doing a mission that's entirely disconnected from all the bullshit she word vomited on you. It's just the game playing catch up and trying to convince you that the world is more exciting than it actually is. Let's finally move away from the story though. I do want to go a little deeper into the presentation of this game before we get into the mechanical aspects of FF16 where most of my criticisms truly lie. Let's begin with the music for this game. Another trait that I've seen praised almost as unanimously is the combat itself. And just like with my distaste of this game, I'm also in the minority on my opinion regarding the soundtrack. Now right out the gate, let me be extremely clear that I do not think the music here is bad. In fact, I think it's something worse than bad. It's boring. Music is a powerful tool for getting the player on board, hammering home the intensity of a kingdom falling apart, or soothing the player into a state of calm before the storm. I never really felt that here, the only song that stuck out to me was the track that plays during major icon fights because of the choir, but those weren't unique to each icon, and if they were, they were too similar for me to notice. At any other time during my experience, I didn't even mentally register the music playing. When you're in combat, you spend most of your time listening to the chaotic sound effect of your skills, during cutscenes you're focusing all of your attention on the dialogue, and when you're just roaming around, the music is too subdued to really factor into your mood or motivation. When the music is loud enough, it just sounds like the same generic orchestral stuff you'd hear in literally any Netflix fantasy show. There weren't any songs that had the urgency of Ambush Attack from FF9, melancholic nostalgia of Hollow Skies from FF7. The haunting beauty of two Xanarkand from FF10. Never Surrender vibes of Don't Be Afraid from FF8, etc. Everything in FF16 feels kind of homogenous in a way that doesn't leave me thinking, hell yeah, what a song! It leaves me in this weird middle ground where I don't hate it, but I wouldn't be able to readily identify what game it was even from if someone just randomly quizzed me. The composer, Masayoshi Soken, also composed for FF14, and I wasn't big on that soundtrack either. I can acknowledge that the guy is certainly talented, but nothing about his work here felt particularly memorable. If anything, it made Nobuo Uematsu's absence just that much more obvious. The visuals of this game are mostly pretty good, aside from the often drab color palette that reminds me of the days in the early 2010s in which every game company thought being gritty meant using browns and grays. The icon battles are a marvelous spectacle that would be awesome to watch on Netflix or something, but despite how disruptive many cutscenes feel, I can still say they do look good. The character models can be a little hit or miss in the facial area, but that can typically be attributed to the uncanny valley and just how good humans are at recognizing when a human face isn't quite there. The only time I run into real issues with the visuals is during combat. Not because the skills don't look cool or anything, but because the particle effects from attacks can often completely obscure the screen in ways that lead to you taking damage. I never experienced any extended frame rate issues, although there were moments when it would noticeably dip, but those were very rare. Like I mentioned before, the aesthetics of this game are just your standard, boring fantasy style. There isn't enough flair to it to make it stand out on its own, especially when it comes to our protagonist. Excluding someone like Noctis, who I also found to have a fairly boring design, every protagonist we've had over the last 25 years, including Lightning, has had their own visual identity that set them apart not only from their party members, but from each other. 
Cloud has his iconic hair and buster sword, Squall has his jacket, the scar on his face, and his gun blade, Zidane has his blue outfit, tail, and daggers, Titus, and I've always said his name like that, it's not going to change, shut up, has his frankly ridiculous but colorful outfit and the stunning brotherhood sword. I didn't play FF12 so I'm going to skip it, please forgive me. Lightning had her outfit, pink hair, overly complicated gun blade, and bitchy attitude, and Noctis was an emo kid. But what is there to adult Clive that makes him so memorable? It's not his absurd outfit that the game forces you into wearing. So what kind of fucking outfit is this? It does not look practical. It's not his shaggy hair and none of his weapons stick out as particularly cool. The only thing that makes him stand out is the brand on his face, which ends up getting removed anyway. This is why I really wish we'd gotten to play the entire game as Teenage Clive. His design was more subdued and he didn't spend every waking moment scowling like a Kmart version of Cloud with far less interesting trauma. Sure, there might not be anything revolutionary about Teen Clive's design, but its simplicity lent it a kind of relatable authenticity. Two arms. <laughs> yes, I do have two arms. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> Clive's issues run much deeper than just having a lame design, but we really need to get into the meat and potatoes of my issues with this game. Talking about the problems with the story is the least of my concerns here, which should be a huge red flag to those of you who know how much I love a good story. Anyway, let's move on to the mechanics of this game. Final Fantasy XVI is an action RPG that seeks to replace the combat we knew from XV and VII Remake with a system more in line with the character action style of something like Devil May Cry. On paper, that sounds like it should be cool as shit, but in practice, I found myself thinking that the game fails as both a character action game as well as an RPG. Let's start with the RPG elements, because those feed into why the combat was a massive letdown after all the hype I'd heard about it. I lost my place in the script. So right out the gate, if you're expecting an RPG experience in line with a standard Final Fantasy game, get fucked. The RPG elements that exist in this game are so barebones that it genuinely makes me question why they even bothered. In terms of gearing up, you have limited options. You've got a weapon slot, a belt slot for some reason, and a slot for bracers. No helm, no chest piece, no greaves. You do, however, get three accessory slots. Why do we need three accessory slots? Well, that's because accessories are a vehicle to make your battle skills feel less lame, but we'll get into skills soon. One of the best feelings in a Final Fantasy game is discovering gear and random chests throughout the world for your party or making it to a new town and running straight to the vendors to see what new equipment you can afford. That sensation does not exist in 16. Here, the only way to get relevant gear is to acquire it from one of the vendors in the main hub zone, the hideaway. You can buy stuff from Karen, the item vendor, or craft it with Blackthorn, the blacksmith. It is literally never worth it to buy the item from Karen because if it's available for purchase, it's available to craft and Blackthorn will allow you to craft an upgraded version of whatever she's selling. The gear also seems to have colors associated with them, with those colors being white, green, blue, purple, and yellow. But don't get your hopes up, the colors, which I assume represent rarity, have no bearing on anything because weapons and gear lack special or defining attributes, but we'll go a bit more into that once we get to the combat. FF16 boasts a crafting system, and by boast, I mean it kind of pathetically whimpers about a crafting system, but that crafting system is about as soulless as everything else in this game. The extent of the crafting is, make a new piece of gear that offers like 5 more HP or attack power. You don't really use it for anything else other than that, so you'll find yourself drowning in crafting materials, but nothing relevant to use them for. Then there's your skills, with a new quote-unquote tree appearing after each dominant you defeat and extract power from. And I use the term tree in the most generous way I possibly can, because there's very little in the way of true builds. You see, each skill has a base state, an intermediate state, and a mastered state. The only time a skill improves on a functional level is when you upgrade it to its intermediate state. That's it. If a skill is to increase in damage, generate more projectiles, or increase its duration, it happens at the intermediate state. And the intermediate state doesn't have levels or tiers or even branches where you can decide if you want to make something hit harder or last longer. You get one upgrade and then it's onto the mastered state. And all the mastery appears to do is allow you to assign a skill to a hotbar for a different icon. So if you want to mix and match skills, you have to spend the often thousands of ability points required to even have that option. This leaves most of your skills feeling underpowered and worse, quite limited. Once you've mastered the skills you use the most, if nothing else piques your interest, you'll just be sitting on thousands of ability points with nothing to spend them on. Can you imagine how much more enjoyable this battle system would have been if instead of a depressingly small tree that doesn't really lead anywhere, they decided to bring back the sphere grid from FF10? Sure, that had some of its own flaws, but I think most fans would have been over the mood to see such a system return. Outside of the mechanical aspects of the RPG side, you have the narrative side, specifically things like exploring the world and the side quests slash activities. 
The world of Alistheia is lovely to look at, but it is so hopelessly devoid of anything interesting or meaningful to do outside of the main questline. The world isn't open by any standards, not in the modern way like FF15, or even in the old school way like FF9. The world is instead broken up into zones that do encompass a decent space, but feel so disconnected from the rest of the world. You spend so much time fast traveling that you never really get that sense of understanding the geography or the landmarks therein. And because the world is designed in this way, you run into the Bethesda problem where large portions of the world are so dull and samey that to make it to the next leg of your quest you're given a waypoint to run toward. This was also an issue for me in FF15 where you couldn't be trusted to navigate your way to your destination because the world wasn't designed in a way that could plausibly allow you to do so. The developers of 16 seem to know this themselves, as there's a mechanic where holding L3 with Torgal nearby will cause him to draw your attention toward the direction you're supposed to be moving in, alongside an icon to guarantee you don't miss it. In certain environments, it's legitimately easy to get turned around after a battle and end up heading in the wrong direction. In older FF titles, you're told where to go, often through cardinal directions with landmarks described to you and you're pushed out into the world to find your way. It felt much more like you were exploring, and through having to explore in such a hands-on way, you were more likely to commit the geography of your zone to mind. What makes the emptiness of the area so baffling to me is the implementation of a dedicated jump button. There's quite literally no reason for it to exist outside of combat encounters because the world isn't built to be truly explored in that way. Hell, there have been times where I would run up to a piece of scenery that couldn't have possibly been any higher than my knees but I couldn't jump over it. I'd have to stop and walk around which just felt odd. Very few things can be leapt or vaulted over but you're unlikely to come across these things unless you're the type that just really likes to try jumping over stuff. When I discovered the jump mechanic, I was excited to consider what it might be used for, but that was immediately drowned in concern when I noticed that any instance that could even potentially require platforming from the player was instead replaced by light arrows that would automatically perform the action for Clive. From that point forward, my expectations diminished more and more as I realized there was no verticality built into the areas. The jump button exists solely for combat. There are no tricky platforming sections that secretly hide good loot to the daring and persistent player. There are no puzzles that require you to move from place to place across multiple floors. There aren't any dungeons that require careful navigation to reach the next story beat. There's nothing in the world that would instill in the player an organic need to implement a jump mechanic, nor the desire to put that skill to use. Which is disappointing coming off the heels of one of, if not the most popular action RPG in recent years, Elden Ring. The jump mechanic wasn't just a garnish on top of a flavorless salad, it had true functionality in your adventure that could lead to very real rewards or viable attack patterns. It was used in the design philosophy of so many areas of the game and was a key element of navigating the world as you saw fit. Even FF15 got this right for one frustrating but deeply interesting moment in one of the late game dungeons that had no enemies and was all about platforming while avoiding traps. And that series of platforming puzzles led the players with the patience to finish it to one of the single most overpowered items in the game, an accessory that allowed Noctis to automatically dodge any attack that was possible to. The very same type of accessory FF16 just gives every player right out the gate. Verticality could have added some much needed personality to some of the many places you're forced to explore. There isn't a single memorable dungeon I can think of because you're essentially on a guided tour the entire time. There was one section of the game with a pseudo stealth mechanic that drove me bananas because I hate the illusion of choice when it comes to how players can approach a situation. Clive and his peers are trying to sneak through his own to do some bullshit I don't remember, so you're all crouching and slow walking to avoid drawing attention to yourselves. The crouch is not a standard mechanic, it's the developers deciding for the player that they're going to be crouching for the time being. But in the hallways you're crouch walking through, there aren't any enemies to avoid or sneak by. When you do come to a room with enemies in it, you have no choice but to fight. Someone in your party mentions how you'll need to fight your way through and the moment you set foot in that room, you're seen and a battle begins. You clear the room and go right back to crouch walking as if you didn't just cause a huge ass commotion. This cycle of fake sneaking until you're forced to fight repeats until you reach your destination. I couldn't help but think if you were just going to require me to fight anyway, why even bother with the pretense of stealth at all? Because it was all just set dressing to further mask the fact that you're just walking through empty hallways going from fight to fight. There was no player agency here, no choice in whether or not a player wanted to go in guns blazing or take the quiet approach. There was no reward for being stealthy and no punishment for going loud because you're not supposed to be thinking about the illusion of choice they gave you. You're supposed to just be happy it's a new Final Fantasy. On top of the empty and frustratingly dull zones, you'll notice that there are these bright pillars of light jutting up out of the ground all over the place. These are items, and credit where credit is due, not needing to stop and interact with them to pick them up is a great quality of life change. What isn't great is the abundance of these lights as well as the rewards you'll receive, though I'm hard pressed to refer to them as rewards. Without fail, when you pick up one of these items, you'll receive one of three things. 
a pitiful amount of gill which is the game's currency, one of two types of potions, or crafting materials. Once you realize how worthless this set of potential drops is, you'll very likely stop going out of your way to pick them up. For gill, there's basically nothing of note to spend your money on. You'll only ever do two things with it, purchase gear or purchase potions. And like I said earlier, you're better served crafting your gear, which is free, and potions aren't terribly expensive. So you'll end up with an overabundance of gill and a stunning lack of options of ways to spend that gill. By the time the game ended for me, I had nearly half a million gill for no reason. I stopped paying attention to it completely. I also realized that I don't understand the value of Gil in this world because there's a side quest where a character in the hideaway screws up and forgets to pay some of their allies, and apparently owes millions in Gil. It kind of left me scratching my head to know that much currency was even in circulation, and if such is the case, the Resistance shouldn't really have any problem acquiring everything they need to oppose the powers that be. Picking up potions sounds like a lifesaver, but in FF16, you're limited on the number of potions you can carry at any given time. At the beginning of the game, you can carry 4 basic potions and 3 high potions for a total of 7 potions. You're not even allowed to buy a surplus that restocks your set outside of combat. If you pick up a potion in the wild but have already reached the carry limit, it'll automatically use the potion on you, which which I will admit in niche cases can save you a potion, but just like Gil, at a certain point it won't make any sense to stop what you're doing to potentially get a potion. Lastly, with crafting materials, you won't be in any dire straits here. Just about every single quest and boss fight in this game awards you with fucking crafting materials for some reason. For all your hard work, doing menial tasks, and handling other people's problems, they give you gill and crafting materials. Not to mention you can buy crafting materials from vendors as the game progresses, including Meteorite, the single most consistent boss reward. Whether you earn it through just doing quests or purchase it, crafting materials stop being anything even remotely resembling scarce until you want to craft endgame stuff that requires very specific materials, and you can't get those from light pillars or vendors anyway. Once you realize all of this, items in the overworld become more of a chore than a reward for your diligent exploration. That unfortunately extends to treasure chests too, and right off the bat, my biggest issue with treasure chests is their design. In other FF games, chests are designed in such a way that they stand out to the player no matter what environment you're in. They're flashy or ornate so that the player can easily spot one as they're quickly moving around an area, and can even force players to engage with small puzzles that increase that feeling of, ooh, there must be something good in there. The chests in 16 are plain, wooden boxes that blend in way too well with the drab, often dark surroundings. You can walk right past one if you aren't keeping your eyes open, and I dread to think of how many I missed myself. Though the contents of these chests inspire little in the way of excitement to find them in the first place. Aside from the usual crap, you're most likely to find accessories. Accessories are hyper-specific pieces of equipment that single out a skill and either increase its damage by an amount that doesn't make any difference in the grand scheme of things, or reduces its cooldown by so little that you won't even notice. You might use them for a while depending on what your favorite skills are, but those accessories don't make any tangible difference in the same way a safety blanket won't make a tangible difference against a gunshot. Occasionally you'll find other types of accessories, but the most likely thing to spring out are skill-related ones. The side quests are a bit of a mixed bag, with some being the epitome of a snooze fest of busy work and others being actually quite nice or wholesome. Like there's a side quest where you pass along some apples to a group of soldiers from a woman named Martel. Unfortunately, Martel was one of the many people that died during one of the story's big set pieces, and all she left behind was her gardening, with the new apple tree being her remaining legacy. This causes the people that knew her to reflect upon the memories they had of her, and it's honestly incredibly touching. There's another side quest where a man named Quentin reveals that he used to be a magistrate until he caught one of his peers hunting bearers for sport. After blowing the whistle, Quentin discovered his peer was never punished, and worse, in retaliation the man had Quentin's family murdered. As a result, Quentin fled and established his own town, slowly amassing an army of people who were also wronged by the man in question, all preparing for the day when they could seek vengeance. Quests like these ones annoy me in a special way because it shows me that there was so much potential in FF16's story to be much more than just a watered down Game of Thrones slash Witcher combo. These good side quests are few and far between though, and the rewards for taking the time to do them isn't worth it for the most part. It's almost always crafting materials, experience, gill, and if you're lucky, some ability points. You'll also get reputation points that can net you some relatively okay stuff as you hit certain thresholds. There are only 4 side quests I can think of that are worth doing because of the rewards. One allows you to get a chocobo which makes traversing some of the larger zones less tedious. One allows you to upgrade the amount of potions you can carry from 7 to 10 before maxing out at 13. One allows you to upgrade the amount your potions will heal you for, which we'll talk about in a bit. And one gives you the best weapon available to you at that point and opens the door for you to craft the best weapon in the first playthrough. Because the ultimate weapon isn't available until your second playthrough for some stupid reason. Nothing else matters. To make side quests even more annoying, there will be instances where the side quests become locked for no other reason than the devs forcing you to prioritize the main narrative. 
This doesn't just apply to quests you haven't accepted. You can be mid-quest and find the next step of that quest is locked because you need to move the story forward. Even if the quests are in an open area and you can see the NPC, the green side quest icon will have a lock next to it indicating that you need to go fuck yourself. I would have preferred if the quest just wasn't visible at all if I needed to march forward with the narrative. Being able to start but not complete a quest because of story progress probably isn't a new concept, but it feels incredibly shitty in a game that already lacks so much depth. Just don't let me accept or see the quest at all if you're just going to lock me out halfway through. Aside from side quests, you also have a monster bounty board. Finding and killing these monsters offers not only a combat challenge as their rank goes up, but rare materials, tons of gill, and a solid amount of reputation points. But not much else. I completed every single one of these so that I could make the strongest weapon in the first playthrough, which also meant I needed to do tons of side quests to even get some of these to show up. This is actually a good time to transition into talking about the combat that so many people have spent so much time praising. The combat does feel refreshing and cool for a little while, but I honestly think that comes down to the flashiness of the attacks and not necessarily the mechanical feel and depth of battle. Especially when you consider the absence of certain Final Fantasy combat staples, the most egregious being the complete and utter lack of a dedicated party system. One of the most engaging aspects of any JRPG is party building. A standard trope of games of this genre is being limited to a party of 3 or 4, but being given access to several additional characters that allow you much more freedom and flexibility in how you put those parties together. This opens the doors for players to discover which characters excel in which category and who to swap out for critical boss encounters. The inclusion of more people to look after adds the additional incentive and joy of locating new gear for everyone, but even more so for the party members you end up rocking with the most. The act of controlling these people in combat deepens your connection to them so that when they're removed from your party for story reasons, you genuinely feel that loss, but you're not left without options. Having a party also allows the game to put you into interesting and sometimes tough situations based on how you've allocated the attention you've given members of your party. For example, in Final Fantasy IX, there's a point where the main antagonist, Kuja, sends the Dane off to fetch something for him, and allows you to select who you want to bring along with you on the mission while holding the remaining party members hostage as insurance. Later on, the game swaps your perspective to the party members you left behind and you're made to escape with that party. So if you took all of your heavy hitters or left some of your backup members underleveled, it made this section of the game that much tougher. But if you leave some of your stronger party members behind to make that section easier, it makes Zidane's portion of the quest tougher. It lends itself to interesting storytelling that hints to the player, hey, maybe try to spread that experience around a little bit just in case we split your party again. And the game does do something similar but slightly tougher down the road as if to see if you learned your lesson. But FF16 doesn't have a party system. The only character you control, the only character you're responsible for, is Clive. Clive is the only one with HP, he's the only one that gets new equipment, and he's the only one that gains experience. Every other character that's capable of sharing the same battlefield as you is just there as set dressing and they're mostly useless, especially during boss fights. The people that can accompany you in combat have no HP, so at the very least, them going down isn't a concern. But everything else about them will eventually make you wonder why they're there in the first place other than to sometimes have something meaningful to say in a cutscene. The amount of damage they do to enemies is pitiful, like, you could cough on someone and do more damage than these allies. I've seen Torgal kill an enemy here and there, but that's often after I've already weakened them with one of my skills. Annoyingly, if your allies aren't attacking, they'll just kind of be standing there slowly stalking around an enemy as if they're playing Pokemon and believe it isn't their turn anymore. On top of being mostly pathetic, your allies almost never draw aggro. In smaller combat encounters, this isn't the worst thing usually, but in boss encounters, it is incredibly frustrating. No matter what happens, the boss monster will always be focused on the player. Sure, having people with infinite HP pulling aggro would trivialize many encounters, but if that's the case, and the alternative is having party members completely ignored even if you yourself haven't dealt any damage, it's probably time to take your ideas back to the drawing board. Leveling up in this game feels like being given a $5 gift card to a place you don't shop that's already been used. This is worthless. It's less than worthless, my boy. That comes down to the implementation of level scaling, which to be fair, if you're doing all the side quests and bounty board stuff, you'll end up outpacing it near the end of the game. But if you aren't that committed to anything other than the story, get used to constantly feeling like your power has stagnated. No matter where you go, the enemies will typically keep pace with you level-wise, so the power fantasy that comes with most JRPGs and action RPGs never ever cements. For those who may not know, a power fantasy in video games refers to the concept of embodying a character that begins an adventure as weak or at the very least on par with the enemies around them, before becoming an entity that outclasses opponents in typically one-sided displays of dominance. 
In RPGs, this takes the form of growing more powerful through collecting gear, skills, and levels and completely outclassing enemies you've already beaten while making you more confident about approaching the stronger enemies you have yet to face. In something like Resident Evil, it takes the form of being scarce on resources and kept in a constant state of anxiety as the obstacles continue to pile up before you eventually come to a point where you can face those same threats with a level head, more powerful weapons, and plenty of resources that you yourself accrued. Power fantasies take many forms in games, but they're very rarely about you being the dominant force from the very beginning, and more so about providing benchmarks and avenues for you to compare where you started to how far you've come. So once the time comes where you feel powerful, there's a sense of achievement there. You earned that sense of power, and the game allows you to enjoy that power retroactively without compromising the challenges ahead. But in FF16, there's never that sense of, wow, look how far I've come, I can flex all over these guys that used to give me tons of trouble. Enemies will stop giving you trouble, but that's because you'll have learned how to fight them and never because you feel like you eclipse them in power. There's no point in the game where you can reflect on how far you've come versus where you started. The closest you get is having new skills, but that doesn't come anywhere close to being the same feeling. I'm very rarely a fan of level scaling in RPGs overall though. I think it feels better to both cautiously face noticeably stronger enemies in a new zone, as well as come back later to confidently demonstrate just how much you've grown against those same enemies. The player level also caps out at 50 for your first playthrough, which feels stupid to me. Every other Final Fantasy game aside from 15 took your party to a max of 99 if you truly wanted to achieve that through a series of systems and mechanics, with the core of that being different zones having different level brackets. If you're an FF9 veteran, think back to the moment when you're going through Burmesia and find a climbable path that leads back to the world map. You get warned before you go out there, and if you ignore those warnings, run smack into a Grand Dragon. It can basically one-shot your entire team with Thundaga if you don't have access to Reflect, and even if you do, it can melee attack. It's a formidable beast that makes for a memorable encounter because it was so far beyond your ability to handle. But you're also not punished for your curiosity because there was a save point in that room before you went out. Yet you know that if you somehow managed to defeat it, a mountain of experience awaited the surviving party members. It was a big risk for a massive potential reward, and it would make you genuinely consider trying to figure out ways to beat it early. But if you couldn't, you knew to be on the lookout for Grand Dragons later and already knew where to find one once you felt confident enough. Now, imagine if that Grand Dragon was scaled to your level for no discernible reason, even after getting warned by a Moogle. Or worse, let's say it wasn't scaled to your level, you beat it, got a ton of experience, but in doing so, you've caused the other enemies in the area to suddenly jump up and level. It would take away that sense of accomplishment. Beating the Grand Dragon should make you feel powerful and make you mechanically more powerful. Leveling up in a Final Fantasy game should matter. It should be a show of your diligence to close the gap in power between your party and the antagonist, and any extra effort should be likewise rewarded by allowing you to truly feel more powerful than your antagonists. Going from a level 1 nobody to a level 75 plus somebody is the power fantasy that's sorely missing here. Everyone is just always on the same level, with the exception of bosses. Bosses are the ones that always feel like they're enjoying a nice power fantasy, and you're stuck chipping away at a stupid stagger meter, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, in order to really expose the weaknesses and flaws of this combat system, I do want to stack it up against its predecessors. Let's go back in time to, yes, more Final Fantasy IX. Aside from the party mechanics we've already discussed, the Active Time Battle System, or ATB, allowed for a wide range of options for players to approach an obstacle. Your party composition had a genuine effect on whether you struggled or steamrolled, and even the struggles could be mitigated if you knew what you were doing. But the merit of having unique options for each character was that it opened the door for strategy. You could spend turns attacking, defending, using magic, using items, or just running away entirely. You could bombard enemies with black magic from Vivi, Garnet and Echo were your white mages and summoners with several summons having unique effects to help you turn the tides, then you can mix and match your heavy hitters to suit your needs. Zidane and Freya could hit hard but were a bit more frail, while Steiner and Amaranth were tankier but could keep pace with Zidane's insane damage output. Queen's blue magic mechanic opened the door for experimentation in devouring monsters to learn skills which could also turn Queena into an absolute powerhouse. On top of that, characters had combat skills and passive abilities, both of which were learned through an assortment of equipment and accessories which incentivized exploration. These skills legitimately allowed you to kit out your party based on what you needed, from things like High Tide which helped you build trance faster, MP Attack which uses the character's MP to raise attack power, Distract which lowers the enemy's physical attack accuracy, to Add Status which adds your weapon's status effects to your attack. There are even specific abilities that grant you immunities to certain status ailments or raise the amount of damage you do to very specific kinds of creatures. At every important moment inside and outside of combat, you as the player are in complete control of your party in the ways that matter. You were able to decide for yourself exactly what kind of party you wanted to build and how you wanted them to fight, and the only thing stopping you from doing so was the ability to find or purchase the necessary gear. 
but when you did manage to upgrade your weapons or armor, you saw immediate returns on your investment. Jumping from Zidane's daggers to his first available twin blade saw a massive and satisfying spike in damage, so you felt a sense of genuine progression. Not to mention the active time battle can be set to active or wait, depending on your preference. With active, enemies will attack the moment they're ready to regardless of if you've done anything or not or if you're in a menu or not. It forces you to think quickly and make threat assessments on top of trying to plan your next move. But if you prefer to slow things down and think through each move carefully, the wait option allows you to do that. But okay, sure, Final Fantasy IX is an old, outdated style in terms of Final Fantasy. What did you really expect from Squeenix, Saturn? Well, at the absolute bare minimum, I expected a combat system on par with Seven Remake. In Seven Remake, Creative Business Unit 1 found that perfect balance between the action of its contemporary peers and competitors, and the strategic nuance of games that kept the fire of RPGs alive. All of the systems leaned into and complemented one another, from the equipment to the materia to the ability to freely swap between party members during combat. Equipment in Seven Remake was versatile enough that every weapon for every character was viable and based wholly on how you wanted to structure your party. Materia was plentiful and worth leveling up to make it that much stronger, alongside being able to be easily swapped to another party member should the need arise. Then there's the fact that even when you're not controlling them, your party members are putting in work and if you needed to prioritize an enemy that your current character was struggling with, it was a simple swap to handle that. There was even its own version of the active and wait system, which allowed players more versatility. If you needed extra time to slide through menus to plot out your next move, time would slow down drastically to make that happen. If you were confident in your ability to think on your feet in the heat of battle, you could ignore that entirely like I did and just take things as they come. And while Seven Remake had a stagger system of its own, it wasn't nearly as player hostile because you still felt as though you were putting damage on the board. Staggering an enemy was a reward that felt awesome and was emphasized by the inclusion of elemental weaknesses and standard magic. When you measure 16's combat against entries in its own franchise, it falls painfully short on every level. It lacks the strategic chess-like energy of older titles and fails to channel the chaotic but satisfying action-oriented system of Seven Remake. Disappointment! But why is that? To answer that question, we need to shift gears and focus on 16's systems. Let's shift to talking very specifically about how combat feels as Clive. If we remove the negligible party and focus solely on the moment-to-moment -moment action, what is that like? Well, like I said, it starts off exciting because of the flashiness, but that wears off soon for a few reasons. Though I think we should establish a few of Clive's basic mechanics first before I just start firing off about the issues I had with combat. Clive has a few things he can do during battle. Square is your basic attack that you can string together into a very basic and unchanging combo. You can hold Square to briefly coat his sword in fire for a slightly chonkier attack, but you'll likely abandon this since the windup is often too slow in actual combat. Not to mention the magic doesn't coat his sword for a duration, it's literally just for that one attack. X is your jump button, it's here specifically to allow you to use your attacks midair, which I don't think I did a single time, though it's also to give you an extra avenue to jump over certain kinds of shockwave style attacks. Good idea, but unfortunately the recovery animation after jumping is long enough that you can't jump right away after landing. These types of attacks are also rare enough that you'll literally never remember to jump over them, and evading through them is just more efficient. Triangle is your ranged magic attack that varies based on whichever icon you're channeling. Circle is your iconic ability, which changes based on who you're channeling and that could be hit or miss. Pressing R1 will cause Clive to evade, pressing L1 will allow Clive to lock onto the nearest enemy, to swap between enemies, you have to press R3 for some reason? More bizarrely, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to which enemy the cursor moves to. Holding R2 will swap square and triangle to whatever icon skills you have equipped for that particular icon. Pressing either button while R2 is held will activate the skill assigned to the respective button. Pressing L2 will allow you to swap between one of up to three icons you can have equipped at one time once you unlock more than just the phoenix. You'll be using this feature constantly. Pressing L3 and R3 together will activate limit break once you've unlocked that. Upright and down on the d-pad are how you use whatever consumables you have equipped, which will likely be potions. Left on the d-pad switches from your consumables to a small menu that allows you to dictate commands to Torgol if he's present. But you'll basically never use this, it isn't worth it at all. And if you use the starter accessory that allows Clive to issue commands automatically, I hope you really like the sound of Clive yelling things to Torgol because for some reason the developers didn't think to turn that feature off with this accessory. Now, combat is about as straightforward as most action RPGs hit the other guy until his HP depletes. However, instead of leaving it there, the developers decided to make combat far more tedious for elite enemies, mini-bosses, and story bosses by adding a stagger system. Underneath certain enemies' HP, you'll see a yellow bar with two segments. 
This is the bar you need to deplete before you can do serious damage to the enemy. At the halfway point there's a mini stagger that mostly just serves to interrupt the enemy's animations, something that's literally only possible to do for bigger enemies through the stagger meter. Once the bar has completely depleted, the enemy will go into a full blown stagger mode. This is when you will be doing noticeably more damage thanks to a damage bonus that increases with aggression, so it's ideal to launch your beefiest attacks or most brilliant combo strengths during this period. This enemy state doesn't last very long before the stagger meter fills back up and you start the process all over again. Maybe I'm in the minority here, but I genuinely hate this kind of stagger system because of how it makes every single boss fight drag ass, especially the story bosses. The skills you unlock take the stagger system into account, which should be good, but I think feeds into my overall opinion that combat is dull. See, when you go to unlock or preview a skill, the information box will tell you based on a number of stars how hard the skill hits as well as how efficiently it can chew away at a stagger meter. Naturally, you're going to want a good balance of heavy hitting attacks as well as skills that can reliably get through that damn stagger bar. Unless you want fights to take forever, you're not really given much freedom in how you build Clive's loadout. But what's the problem, I'm sure some of you might be thinking? If someone wants to prioritize skills that hit hard instead of skills that can also speed up the process of staggering, that's their prerogative and what's so bad about that? Well, I'm sure a few of you noticed a specific word I mentioned in regard to skills back when we were talking about the less than exciting accessories this game throws at you, and that word is cooldown. Some of the eagle-eyed folks may have noticed that Clive doesn't have an MP bar anywhere on screen, and that's because MP as a resource does not exist in this game. Instead, each of your attacking skills has a cooldown that can vary in length from tolerable to good lord it's been 83 years! So you spend most of each battle just spamming the square button doing the same combo over and over and over. And yes, I know there's a magic infused combo based on timed presses of the triangle button, but it's not worth it. Limit Break also falls into a weird purgatory thanks to Stagger. While Limit Break does fill relatively quickly from both hitting enemies and getting hit by enemies, it's often less efficient to use it outside of a Stagger window since you deal increased damage during Limit Break. So despite it being a resource you have access to pretty regularly, you end up holding on to it until you can stagger the enemy. Aside from its slight regenerative traits that could save you at low HP, it is a complete waste of potential damage to use it at any other point than a stagger. Once you realize that you can't truly use your skills as freely as you like, you end up in a kind of flowchart. It ends up feeling like you're playing FF14, ironically enough, because you start min-maxing based on your playstyle and ultimately get locked into a rotation. For those of you who haven't played any MMOs, a rotation is a set order in which you consistently use your skills because of a combination of the cooldowns, their attack attributes, and their overall efficiency to what it is you're trying to accomplish. FF16 ends up doing that in a bit more heinous of a way thanks to the stagger system and implementation of cooldowns. Let's say you're up against a boss with a stagger meter and a chunky bit of HP. The first thing you're going to do is launch the skills that can chew down the stagger bar, and you'll often prioritize doing that in an order based on cooldown times. However, depending on just how quickly you get through the first half of the stagger meter, you'll refrain from using your high damage skills because of the understanding that you'd be running the risk of those same skills not being available for use once the stagger does trigger. Once the stagger finally triggers, then you'll activate Limit Break. Then you'll launch all of your heavy hitting skills. You save all of that for this very specific and very short window of time. The moment you complete this step and the enemy has regained their composure, you go right back to the beginning of the flowchart where you're doing piss for damage. Another factor that makes cooldown so diabolical is that sometimes, in order to avoid big damage, you'll be forced to evade in the middle of your skill animation, which forfeits the activation of the skill and places it on cooldown. Then you have the coin toss of being interrupted by an enemy attack while you're preparing to launch a skill. Sometimes the animation will be cancelled but the cooldown won't proc so you can just try again, but oftentimes it'll treat the skill like a failed activation and skip to the cooldown. Remember, you can only reliably interrupt smaller foes, so this is mainly a problem during boss and mini boss encounters where every skill counts in terms of not dragging out the fight. Adding another straw to the camel's back is that unless you're in the quote unquote open sections of the world, you can't flee from or skip battles. The moment you go into a room that has enemies in it, you are there until you've killed the last enemy. It's very Devil May Cry in that aspect, and as much as I did and do still kinda hate that trait of DMC, at least there was demon energy blocking the doors to prevent your escape. It made it feel as though the creatures were doing their best to trap you so that they could kill you. But here, there's no such force barring your exit. Typically, between Clive and Escape is a button press and a brief animation, usually in the form of pushing a door open or slipping through a crack in a wall or climbing something, etc. Even if you make it over to that exit zone way before any enemies reach you, just the fact that they've spawned is enough for Clive to forget how to interact with things. Unlike former Final Fantasy games, there's no fight or flight, it's all fight all the time regardless of what you as the player want to do. 
FF16 wants so desperately to be both a Final Fantasy game as well as a Devil May Cry game. But in Devil May Cry, Dante and the others have access to a wide variety of skills and weapons that aren't limited by anything other than your ability to successfully string them together. It comes down to the player understanding and executing the inputs rather than some arbitrary set of limitations. It's a deceptively deep combat system that demands you learn those systems if you want to survive on the higher difficulties. Devil May Cry is the epitome of easy to pick up, difficult to master. Whereas Final Fantasy XVI's combat is easy to pick up, but difficult to enjoy. I'm telling you, it's just a watered down Devil May Cry. 16's combat is all the flashiness of Devil May Cry without understanding what it was that made that specific combat system appeal to its fans so much. Which blows my fucking mind since the combat designer for this game worked on Devil May Cry 5. I would have genuinely preferred to just have a dedicated resource for magic that was up to me to spend as I saw fit, the way I can in most other Final Fantasy games. If I want to spend all of my MP spamming Rising Flames or Pile Driver, I should be allowed to do that and deal with whatever consequences come with depleting that resource. I'm never one to shut down innovation, but when that innovation comes at the cost of my experience as a consumer, especially when innovation wasn't necessary in the first place, that's when I have problems. The reason you get locked into these flowcharts isn't even exclusively because of cooldowns, it's because combat lacks depth in three specific ways. Status conditions, standard magic, and elemental weaknesses. I'm not kidding, these are absent in a Final Fantasy game. There's no poison, no sleep, no silence, no blind, no slow, no stop, no haste, no float, no reflect, basically anything that will allow you to have a tangible effect on the battlefield in ways you can strategically plan for are absent. Aside from your ranged magic, which is about as dangerous as a spitball, things like Vyraga, Thundaga, Blizzaga, Kiraga, Bio, Meteor, Doom, all that shit is absent here. With the absence of a party system and the need for party roles, alongside a new emphasis on melee combat, there's seemingly no need for the roster of spells associated with black and white mages or hell, even blue mages to exist, which takes another potential playstyle off the table. Not that that would matter anyway, since there doesn't appear to be any kind of elemental weakness rock paper scissors system in this game. I used ranged fire magic on a firebomb and did the exact same damage two fights later to a plant monster. Are you shitting me? If you're going to take away all of the iconic spells that have been staples of the franchise for decades, at least give me elemental weaknesses. Like how on earth are the most recent Pokemon games a more feature complete RPG than fucking Final Fantasy? This is truly the worst goddamn timeline. This is why I mentioned earlier that even the tiniest of improvements to your weaponry meant swapping, because weapons don't have any kind of elemental or status attributes that could push the needle towards keeping it in use based on a player build. If a weapon you were upgrading to only gave you 5 extra attack power, but the weapon you were using had a chance to poison on hit, you'd very likely stick with the poison affliction until a better weapon truly came along. At every available opportunity to organically fuse the RPG elements of Final Fantasy with the high-octane gameplay of Devil May Cry, they failed miserably in ways that ruins aspects on both sides of the fence. At this point, I can't even tell if there's not enough Final Fantasy in my Devil May Cry, or if there's too much Devil May Cry in my Final Fantasy. Either way, this isn't the plate I ordered, and I'm sending it back to the kitchen. Can I have one fucking battle system and a fucking deeply cooked Final Fantasy? Okay, I think I've procrastinated enough. Let's finally take a moment to address the elephant in the room, which are the cutscenes. Now, on a very basic level, I have zero problems with cutscenes. They get to show off the vocal talent on hand, they give you a break from whatever activities the game has placed in front of you, and they're supposed to move the story or characterization forward. But FF16 takes this a few bridges too far. As mentioned earlier, this game is upward of 80% cutscenes. That might come across as extreme hyperbole, but so much of my time was spent with my hands off the controller watching people talk about things that weren't even remotely interesting. To make matters worse, these cutscenes are rarely short and can drag on for minutes at a time. At first it was kind of novel, but once the mediocrity of it all settled in, I found myself frustrated every time a cutscene began. You get to play the game for bursts at a time, usually when you're sent to roam one of the larger zones. But inevitably, it boils down to watching a cutscene, running a few dozen meters down a road to watch another cutscene, to fight one battle to watch another cutscene, to run back to the quest giver to watch another cutscene. Rinse and repeat. That's the entire game. Every single time you thought you were in the clear, another cutscene pops up like, Hello there. Their numerous nature is compounded by the sentiment I shared earlier that they're exceedingly boring for the most part. If there was consistently something to pique my interest happening, I might have been a little softer in my opinion, but front and center all the time was the fact that I was spending most of my time watching characters do stuff. You spend what feels like so little time actually playing the game that the frustration honestly detracts from the cutscenes when they are good. 
The game might not have anywhere close to the most fulfilling gameplay, but I'd still like to play it. It's in the title of my role in relation to this product. If I wanted to simply be a watcher, I'd have turned on a movie or show. The best comparison I can make is to that episode of Black Mirror, Bandersnatch. Remember how it was kind of marketed like you'd have so much control over the narrative through your choices, yet once it came out it was mostly just you watching something with very occasional interactions? Like it was definitely a neat idea, but not what you asked for. That's what Final Fantasy XVI feels like, but stretch the story out to anywhere between 36 and 40 hours without expanding the interactivity too much. I'm often at my most displeased with this game when it comes to the major boss fights of the story, and there are two major reasons for that. The absolutely fucking awful length of most of them, and the inclusion of a very specific character I hate that we're going to call Cutscene Clive. The lesser of the two evils would be the length of the boss fights themselves, specifically those regarding the other dominants, with the exception of Benedicta, the dominant of Garuda. Benedicta's fight is broken up into two phases that only took about 9 minutes, followed by a two-phase fight with Garuda not too long after that that took up about 14 minutes, including cutscenes. Of all the icon battles, those two are the most mercifully short and at that time, combat still felt pretty okay, but once you get to fights like Titan, Bahama, and Ultima, you're going to be sitting there for upwards of 40 minutes. Your ability to meaningfully end battles on your own terms through your own displays of skill and understanding of the battle system take a backseat to the spectacle. Fights are often interrupted by cutscenes that I assume were designed to make things feel more tense but ends up ruining the flow altogether. This incessant need to make everything bombastic elongates every single major fight in a way that I genuinely found exhausting before terribly long. Part of the reason I find these set pieces so annoying half the time is due to the periodic transformation into Ifrit Clive will undergo during these important battles. It takes the issue of your limited combat options and cranks it up to maximum. When you're playing as Ifrit, you have a basic melee combo, a basic ranged attack, and a fire dash. The game actively takes away combat skills and leaves you holding your dick until way later in the game when it finally gives Ifrit two skills to utilize. During these sequences, you're still dealing with enemies that are protected by a stagger meter, but now you don't have the tools necessary to quickly carve away at the brick wall the game is forcing you to confront. Without the skills you've gotten into the rhythm of making battles like these even the slightest bit bearable, you're left with just the damage sponge and none of the workarounds. It got to the point where I legitimately dreaded the idea of turning into Ifrit. I knew I could get through a battle faster as just Clive. The only saving grace for some of these endurance matches is that there are HP checkpoints, almost as though the developers understood just how fucking ridiculous it would be to not only limit the player's restoratives, but then make them deal with these tedious, multi-phase gauntlets where failure meant starting a 45 minute fight all over again. But if you know you need to give your players that kind of wiggle room, you should probably take the entire system back to the drawing board and start over because you fucked up drastically somewhere along the way. Can you imagine playing any other JRPG or action RPG like Persona or Elden Ring and having boss HP checkpoints? Oh, you died when you got Izanami down to 25% HP? No worries, just come back, she's still hurting. Made it to phase 2 of Millennium's fight before dying to Scarlet Rot? It's all good, when you get back, she'll start in phase 2. Think about any boss fight that left you feeling shaken but like you just climbed Mount Everest after overcoming it, and add boss HP checkpoints at every increment of 25% and then tell me with a straight face that it would be just as memorable to you. Look me in the eyes and tell me that the accomplishment would feel just as hard fought. You can't, because you know it would cheapen the entire experience. It would take a boss that took every bit of your skill and system knowledge to defeat and trivialize it. So with that in mind, if we wouldn't accept something like that in the games we hold close to our hearts, and we wouldn't accept it in older Final Fantasy titles, why are so many people willing to accept it now? I think now's a perfect time to pivot into the potion system. As I mentioned, unless you do a very specific set of side quests, you're limited to 4 potions and 3 high potions at any given time. Unlike previous Final Fantasy games, these potions don't heal the player for flat amounts like 150 or 400. Instead, they heal a percentage of your maximum HP. Potions heal for 20% and high potions heal for 40%. This can also be increased via very specific side quests, taking potions to a maximum of 28% and high potions to a maximum of 52%. Potions can be used at basically any time during combat, even if you're in the process of taking damage. So if you need to, you can spam the potions to get back into a safe range. You'll almost exclusively be running through potions during boss and mini boss fights, where you're most likely to get hit by some bullshit. But just like accessories for skills, there are accessories for your potions that increase their potency. So if you're doing side quests and racking up reputation points to trade away, you'll end up in a position where you can carry more potions, their base healing gets increased, and you have access to accessories that buff their healing properties even further. Potions in this game are actually disgustingly strong to the point where you won't fear any boss fight at all. 
especially because the issue with the boss HP checkpoints is further emphasized by one tiny little detail, and that's the fact that when you die and choose to continue, the game fully restocks your supply of potions, regardless of if you've used them all before crossing an HP threshold. So you can quite literally just continue to throw yourself at any boss for as long as you like, whittling them down little by little with zero fear of running out of healing items. As long as you cross one of those HP thresholds, you can literally die on purpose and get your healing items back and not be punished. Let me reiterate, this game isn't hard by any stretch of the imagination, it's just tedious. The next thing I want to talk about is very close to being my least favorite aspect of this game. Yeah, despite everything I've gone over, this is one of those things that really left a sour taste on my mouth, and that's Cutscene Clive. A cutscene character is something that I'm lifting from H Bomber Guy's Deus Ex video. It's essentially a split between the player and the character in a way that robs the player of agency or catharsis through payoff. I'm not usually all that annoyed by characters doing things in RPGs that I wouldn't, especially if it's not the type of RPG that offers dialogue options or branching choices. And Final Fantasy isn't known for that, that's more Persona's lane, and I'm perfectly cool with that. However, FF16 gets so caught up in sucking its own dick that it ends up disrespecting the player in a way I don't think I've ever truly experienced in the form of Cutscene Clive. I noticed it toward the beginning of the game, after your first quest with Sid. You run into an enemy named Midnight Raven, and I'm like, cool, the first real test of skill. You spend a few minutes beating this dude down, and then suddenly, a cutscene begins that's basically a glorified quicktime event, and then cutscene Clive gets the final hit to kill the enemy. I found this rather peculiar, but I kinda let it go. I voiced that it was a little weird, that I didn't get to finish it, but whatever. Fast forward to your fight with Benedicta. You and your dog beat her down and you do get the final hit, so I was like, okay, cool, the Midnight Raven thing was probably just an outlier. But not even 30 minutes after that, when you're fighting Garuda in both of her phases, Cutscene Clive is the one that gets the final blow. That's when I really noticed the pattern and voiced my concern to my Twitch chat. So I kept my eye out. During every single major story boss, I made sure to keep an eye out for Cutscene Clive. And like clockwork, when the enemy was down to anywhere between 10 and 20% health remaining, a cutscene would start and I just knew I wasn't going to be the one to get the final hit. The final bit of HP was always depleted by cutscene fucking Clive. To add insult to injury, if you have the enemy staggered once you reach this threshold, you'll notice that they've actively stopped taking damage. Your damage numbers will still pop up, but they're not being subtracted from the HP bar. But the moment they recover from the staggered state, cutscene Clive is right there. This also applies to Clive when he's taken on his Ifrit form, and I always found it both stupid and insulting that damage numbers would continue to pop up during these moments. Because A, I'm not the one putting those numbers on the board, so it doesn't matter to me, and B, I'm not impressed by massive damage numbers totaling the hundreds of thousands thanks to a cutscene. Why should I be hyped or awestruck when you've taught me to hate certain characters who deserve their comeuppance, then you force me to chip away at their HP over the course of a fight that often takes way too long, you force me, the player, to do all of the work, and then when I'm on the precipice of defeating a hyped up enemy and feeling accomplished in my own execution of skill, you remove control from me so that cutscene Clive gets the glory of the kill. You don't want to be like this. This is disgusting. This is awful in every way. If I could kill it, I would, but I legally can't. Each time this occurred, I felt like the game had little respect for me as the player, and even worse, little respect for my time. It's one thing to let me get the final strike myself before going into a cutscene, and something else entirely to cut me off at the knees just so you can put on a show. It's how I imagine detectives feel in movies when they've been working hard to catch a criminal and then the feds swoop in and take over. When the need for explosive high energy visual bombast takes priority over the hard work and agency of the player, you've completely lost me. As a final note, to get ahead of a weird defense I'm sure will crop up, I am aware that there's a New Game Plus mode with a Final Fantasy difficulty mode. This mode remixes enemy and item placement, and items can be reinforced additional times, as well as unlocking new and stronger crafting options. The level cap is also pushed from 50 to 100 for you and enemies. But let me ask you this. In a game where you aren't incentivized to explore, combat is dull and repetitive, the quests are either go get the thing or go kill the thing, and the experience is much closer to a painfully long film that you can sometimes interact with for meaningful stretches of time than an actual game, why on earth would or should anyone subject themselves to a second playthrough? I honestly tried, but skipped the cutscenes every chance I got. And when you do that, it comes into full focus just how much of the game is spent running very short distances just to watch or skip another cutscene. The replayability here is so close to zero that I'm stunned Square Enix bothered implementing it at all. So no, New Game Plus doesn't fix or add anything remotely worth it to the experience. And even if it did, you'd still be required to play through the game one full time to have that option. I typically love New Game Plus, but I cannot imagine a timeline where I willingly played through this game again. Oh, let me see the baby. Ah, ah, ah.
Wanna hold him? No! So the question all of this brings forward is where does this leave me in relation to Final Fantasy as a franchise? To be honest, the waters feel a little murky for me now. Final Fantasy has brought me so much joy over my life and set the bar for how long-form stories can be told in video games in my eyes. I've lost countless hours of sleep sitting up late at night staring at my television telling myself, once I get to the next save point I'll go to bed, only to end up noticing the sun creeping through my blinds. I've gotten into heated arguments around the school lunch table with friends as we debated about hypothetical matchups and who would beat who. I've sat in shock when many a plot twist came out of nowhere and ripped my heart out. I was sitting there in confusion, wondering how Spirits Within was even remotely a Final Fantasy story, to then years later be cheering with my friends in my living room as we watched Cloud and Gang return for Advent Children. I can explicitly remember only being interested in Kingdom Hearts because I'd heard there were Final Fantasy characters in it. I wasn't being hyperbolic when I said Final Fantasy was a big part of my life, and those stories, those memories, and those games will always be there. I loved Final Fantasy VII Remake and I'm still thrilled for the upcoming release of Rebirth, but that's because I recognize and respect that story as a Final Fantasy story. So if Square Enix decides to continue making remakes after Seven is completed, please remake FF9 I'm begging you, then I'll happily dive back into those worlds that I've become familiar with and attached to. But as far as the future of the Final Fantasy franchise in the numerical order, after 13, after 15, and now after 16, I think this is where I finally say enough is enough for me and hop off the train. Maybe Final Fantasy as an intellectual property just isn't for me anymore, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing inherently wrong with outgrowing something after it abandons the things that you loved and stops being what you enjoyed. In trying to appeal to a wider demographic, a lot of the magic of what could have been an incredible return to the franchise was traded away, and in doing so they've guaranteed that with the exception of the Seven Trilogy that this, at least for the foreseeable future, was my final fantasy. And as always, thanks for watching.